Hi guys, it's Miss Morales, and I was scrolling through Twitter last night, and I came across an idea from another educator, and I thought it was a really good idea. Um, with the delay of school coming two weeks later than we should have normally started, I thought to myself, well, what if your child doesn't have access to books right now? Um, and so that idea just kind of morphed from there off of what the other educator had done. Um, and so I thought maybe I would start something called a bedtime series that I'm going to try to do a book um, every single night until school starts. Uh, 20 minutes a day is super important to your child's education, your scholar's education. Um, and so I wanted to kind of help contribute that and kind of alleviate, especially if your child doesn't have access to a book right now. Um, so I wanted to create this uh, called Bedtime Stories. Um, I'm going to be reading a book today called The Eleventh Hour, a uh, curious mystery, and it's by Graham Bass. He's also the author of another book called Anna Amelia, um, and this is a great book. It's about a book where a, um, I believe it is an elephant, yes, an elephant is turning 11, and he decides to throw a big bash with his friends, 11 of his friends, um, and he is going to create 11 games as well as a big old feast at the end for his birthday to celebrate. Well, things don't go quite as planned for this elephant. Um, his games kind of have disastrous results throughout the book as well as a big old disaster at the end for this giant feast he's created. I really love this book due to the illustrations. You can tell by just the front cover alone that there is a whole lot going on. But what's interesting about these illustrations is that there are hidden pictures and meanings throughout this book that you really kind of get your got to get your hands on it in order to see this. So it creates a bit of a mystery. So I wanted to go ahead and read this to you tonight to start off our bedtime uh, stories. And with that, I'm in my bed wearing my gangster napper shirt. I thought that would be appropriate to start it off. So the eleventh hour <clears throat> by Graham Bass. When Horace turned 11, he decided there should be some kind of celebration for my friends, he said, and me. For though I've been the age of eight and nine and six and seven, this is the very first time that I'll ever been 11. With that, he set to work and wrote the name of every guest and the 11 sorts of food that elephants like best. He wrote the invitations next and sent them off that day. And finally, 11 games for everyone to play. Now Horace was a clever lad. He planned the day with care, ensuring that his party would be quite a grand affair. Sorry, I know there's a little bit of a glare on that. But only in the kitchen was his genius unfurled, for elephants are verily the best cooks in the world. He started off with cheesecake full of strawberries and cream and then moved on to pastries to a chocolate supreme. And though it may be said, perhaps that Horace made a mess, the feast that he created was fantastic, nothing less. It was early in the morning when the pipe, uh, party guests arrived and all were wearing costumes the most intriguingly contrived. The pig came as an admiral, the zebra as a punk. The rhino was an astronaut, his spacesuit made of junk. The swan arrived as a princess pure, the most enchanting sight, bejeweled with rows of precious stones and dressed in purest white. And with her came an Indian with arrow, spear, and bow, a handsome bangle tire whom no one seemed to know. The mouse came as a musketeer, his head and hat held high, a swagger in his footsteps, a twinkle in his eye. The cat was Cleopatra, queen of Egypt and the Nile, and masquerading as a judge was Sam the Crocodile. And when there was a pair of twins, two sisters, both giraffes, who turned up dressed as angels and received a round of laughs. Their halo shone upon their heads, two shiny golden rings, and from their nylon tutus sprouted painted cardboard wings.
The guests were met by Horace as they stepped into the hall. He dressed as a centurion, centurion of Rome before the fall. And once inside, they looked around and noticed with a smile the way the hall had been designed in high Renaissance style. No sooner had they entered than a rumor filled the air and stopped the conversation as news spread everywhere. Their host had made a banquet. It was huge, immense in size. And one by one, the guests were drawn within to feast their eyes. For there upon the table was the feast that Horace made, a wondrous spread of cakes and buns and jugs of lemonade. And in its midst of centerpiece of grand design was placed, left no doubt that young or Horace had superb artistic taste. But if the guests had hoped to eat the banquet then and there, they soon found out their host had plans for what they'd eat, for when they'd eat, uh, what they'd eat and when. For Horace told them firmly, not a crumb would they devour until the time he had the set, the eleventh hour. The games began at 8.05. A sack race marked the start with sacks of every size and shape so everyone took part. They'd set off a crackling pace with Eric on the, to the fort, but close behind the others hopped on trotter, hoof, and paw. They raced across the croquet lawn, then up towards the house, but as they reached the halfway point, the pig tripped on the mouse. He landed with a heavy thud and several others fell, but Kilroy kept his balance and went on to win as well. The ballroom was the venue for the second party game, but though the rules were simple, no one seemed to know the aim. They, cha they charged around a ring of chairs beneath the chandeliers, and while Sam played Mozart magic flute and uh, British grenadiers. But one by one, the chairs became just piles of splintered wood. The guests all agreed that this new game was jolly good. And then the final chair collapsed, they stopped and checked the score, and since no one had won at all, they settled on a draw. The pig procured a pack of cards and soon the game began. Unbeknownst, unbeknownst excuse me, unbeknown to all the to all the rest the Admiral had a plan. For Oliver won every chick, trick, his conquest was complete. A string of luck, or could it be the porker was a cheat? A little later in the day some guests played snakes and ladders. Upon a board that squirmed and turned, the pythons, asps and, asps, and adders. The board was set, the race was won, the game had just begun. When Thomas went and ate the dice, no one had ever won. A cricket match was organized for those who knew the game. The twin giraffes had no idea but fielded just the same. But Oliver, a boastful pig, had made it understood that when it came to batting, he knew he was rather good. The tiger donned the keeper's gloves and crouched behind the stumps and waited for a chance to show his skill at leaps and jumps. The pig went for a mighty swing but only clipped the ball. Maxwell leapt and caught him out. The pride comes before the fall. The cricket match had finished when the zebra took his cue and challenged Tiny Kilroy to a game of pool or two. But Kilroy's skill was quite immense for someone so small, though Eric thought he'd win, hoofs down, he didn't sink a ball. Other guests enjoyed a lively game of blind man's bluff. With Piggy in the middle, you'd think he'd had enough. He blundered, blindfolded round the room, groped, grabbed, and gripped, with all others squealed with joy, dogged, dodged, ducked, and dipped.
A tennis match was underway a little later on with crocodile and tiger versus elephant and swan. The elephant was shaky. It appeared he'd lost his nerve. The score was 40 to 30 with crocodile to serve. Sam tossed the ball in the air, then struck it with such force that Horace didn't see it start upon its face fateful course. And sure enough, it hit poor Horace square upon the head. Game, set, match, the tiger cried. That's life, poor, poor Horace said. And meanwhile, midst the Egyptian columns, row on a uh, silent row, a seeker searched while others hid a game that we all know. But through her eyes were large and bright, the cat's success was small. For while she searched the utmost care, she found no one at all. And far above a hill beyond the tennis court, a rhino and the zebra sat in silence deep in thought. They studied every rook and pawn and king and queen and knight. They both agreed it looked too hard and quit without a fight. The final game was tug of war with two teams of equal weight, but every mind was on the feast and time was getting late. The rhino slipped, the game was lost, they cared not in the least, for finally the hour had come, twas time to eat the feast. My friends, said Horace to his guests, my friends, lend me your ears, for now it is that I, your host, have reached eleven year years. But if he planned to make his speech, his virtues to his spouse, he missed his chance because everyone took off towards the house. They raced each other up the stairs, 11 steps in all, then past the marble statues leading to the banquet hall. Then there they stopped, nobody spoke, they stood in disbelief. For all the food had disappeared, a guest cried, A thief! The cakes had turned in scattered crumbs, no cream was to be seen, and nothing now remained what once there, uh, where once the chocolate mousse had been. The centerpiece had toppled, not a strawberry was left, but who, they cried, could possibly have managed such a theft? The zebra said, it wasn't I. By all my stripes, I'd rather die. The tiger said, it wasn't me. I've far too much integrity. The cora cried, it wasn't us. We wouldn't dare cause such a fuss. And Kilwar squealed, I'm far too small. One mouse could never eat it all. The swan looked darkly at the pig. The thief must have been who's someone who's big. But Oliver denied all the guilt and said, now Thomas, he's well built. The rhino sobbed through sniffs and tears. I've known our host for years and years. And though my appetite is large, I must deny this dreadful charge. The cat had yet to say a word, which Eric thought could be inferred. As, as prima facie evidence of feline guilt, read this offense. But Alexandra lashed her, chair, uh, her tail. Your theories are to no avail. We cats do not steal each other's food. It's wicked, bad, and very rude. The judge was next, I too deny. Although I have no alibi, I'll blame for this horrendous crime. He blabbed on for quite some time. I'm not the kind of crocodile to fake a tear or force a smile. To my ca um, my ca counterparts is to plan to read. My friend, I did not do this deed. The mystery was curious, the guests were at a loss, but Horace had initiative. He showed them who was boss. The feast was gone, we can't change that, but now it's clear to see that what we need is cheering up, just leave it all to me. He rushed into the kitchen and was gone for quite a while, then reemerged with sandwiches, a flourish, and a smile. 
This lot is not as fancy as the birthday feast, he said, but 11 times as healthy because it's made with whole wheat bread. Then they sat and ate their lunch. There came one last surprise when Horace asked everyone to kindly close their eyes. And it was there, a birthday cake, the guests all clapped and cheered. He kept it in the kitchen and it hit hadn't disappeared. So they picnicked on the lawn until the evening fell and everyone left satisfied the day had finished well. But in the end, although the thief was someone they all knew, they never found out who it was that stole the feast. Can you? So. That is going to be the end of this book. However, there's more to it. In the very back, it has a note for you detectives. It has a code. And throughout this book, there is hidden messages. And you can easily figure it out once you figure out the code. So it tells you to go through here and replace different letters with other letters. And so it's really interesting. Also, there's a little additional thing on the back of this book. It's called The Inside Story and it's top secret. So within this, there's within the illustrations, there's something hidden in each one that's really interesting. So this book will be in my library when we get back on the 11th and the 11th hour, how fitting. So if you want, if this book intrigues you and you wanna look into here, um, it will be in my library for you to look at and you are welcome to check this out from me as well. Um, these, uh, vocabulary word cards that I held up. These might be some of the more difficult words in the book, so I thought I'd go ahead and just write them down. There's something we can dis um, discuss that first week of school as well, and we'll have them in our uh, word wall in our classroom. So I hope that this book is interesting, and I will try to find another book as well, and we will continue this until I see you on Monday the 11th. Thanks, guys!